All right, baby. We are back. Finally, things are getting back in motion. Hell yeah. So, I went through a shit ton of shit. An emotional roller coaster. My goodness. Get out of here. I don't care about your block. But, I finally got everything working. Everything should be normal. There should be no issues whatsoever. Hopefully I didn't jinx it. But, everything is working again. I even tried Apex Legends and everything was working seamlessly. So hopefully this works, because I, I haven't tried this game. But, um, with the, with the changes. But anyway, let me tell you what the fuck happened. So, I installed Dragon Center. Now, I know what you're thinking if you know anything about anything. Dragon Center bad. It no do good. Yes, see, I know it. I know it don't do good. But the thing is, it was necessary. I needed to install it. Because I needed to install the BIOS for my motherboard again. I needed to install the drivers that I had erased again. Because shit started being bad. And I feel like I got a virus or some shit. Um, or some sort of malware issue where after I uninstalled the thing before um, and like I tried deleting it just like a, a bunch of files um, everything must have it must have caused like an issue because there were some files that I couldn't delete anymore and they were just still there no matter what yeah so that could have also caused some issues and there were some other things that also might have done the bad um, so before I uninstalled Dragon Center, I uninstalled all the little uh, extra shit that, you know, I had installed with it. Because I wanted to see if anything, uh, if there, if certain utilities that seemed like they would be useful would actually work. Turns out, no. But, <laughs> I tuned everything back to the way that it should be. Then I removed all the utilities, all that shit, one by one. And after I removed everything that could be removed, uh, I was still messing with the settings just to check and see if, uh, you know, if, if it could help in any sort of way. Because after I uninstalled it the first time, before I reset my computer, uh, shit started going all, just completely fucking whack. And that's the result of part three that you yeah. Uh, when I tried getting back on, that was after yeah. I completely reset my computer and reinstalled some shit. I don't know what the fuck is happening, but it, everything was going bad. But, after that, I, um, I uninstalled Dragon Center. I turned on the performance shit, uh, over in, like, the advanced settings for something. Um, let me check right now. Let me just find that for you. So there's a game mode setting in Windows. Obviously, I have that on. There's also uh, a graphic setting to the right of that for me. I don't know if you have that, but the graphic setting, hardware acceleration, GPU scheduling, blah, 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 blah. Reduce latency and improve performance. You want to restart your PC to have the changes take effect. I turned that on. Because obviously I need that on. Uh, that's what I had on before. And after all that, after I got everything installed again, and turned that on, it started to work. Nothing was going, like, too super high. Everything was looking normal as it should have been. And everything is working absolutely perfect. Working seamlessly. Beautiful. Beautiful. Look at this, look at this shit. Look at that, look at them. Look at these dudes. Look at, look at their beautiful ugly look faces. Out. Like a fucking gavel. Anyway. Now that that ordeal is fucking over finally. <sighs> we can get back to reading. Yes! Let's fucking go, baby. Uh, did I not finish this? Did 
pretty sure I finished that. Maybe not. Pretty sure I did, yeah. At least for the last stream, but I don't know how jumbly it was last stream. Was it jumbly at all last stream? Mint Master, I know I read that, or I was about to, or some shit like that. So I think Mint Master, somewhere around there. Unless. Let me just do a quick check of the last stream, uh, just to see if everything was fine. <laughs> Dickheads. <laughs> Mint Master. And skipped frames. What are you talking about? Indian Brewer. Okay, so I think the sounds are perfectly fine. It's just the the visuals. Once I got off the um, the desk, is when things went all. Anyway. Uh, it was Mint Master, yeah, that I start that I left off at. Look at that! I'm going into Opera, and it's not making the noise, and it's, I'm not having any issues. The thing is, I'm feeling pretty. Good. Things are just fantastic right now. Things are just fantastic. followed specific rules regarding about okay so monk and monastic life is where we left off i think yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. so noble nobles and officials noble officials noble officials this is where we left off cleo all right, finally, finally we are back. Ah. Noble officials, let's get back into it. Hetman, originally the commander in some armed forces with a rank equivalent to captain. Later on, the role became that of a civic governor, selected from amongst the local nobility who represented the monarch in a given territory. Hofmeister. From the German Hof, meaning a court or manor, a hereditary office at the royal court. He was responsible for management of the court. Oh. Under Chamberlain. Along, so like, does that mean that he's the fact checker for the fact checkers? Under Chamberlain. 
Along with the Chancellor, the Under Chamberlains, in Latin Subcamerarius, Camerarius, Subcamerarius, was a member of the office represented the sovereign. That's a weird. That's a weird phrase. Um, was a member of the office represented the so was a member of the office represented okay the sovereign in the royal cities such as paternitaries paternitaries or notaries Burgrave that's what it just hurts my brain Burgrave the representative of the sovereign and representative of provincial officials of knightly status his duties included management of the city and leading the army when needed. He's like the president. Kinda. Painter. During the early mi Middle Ages, no one knew the names of the artists who painted the panels and frescoes, and the bulk of their works remain anonymous to this day. Often the paintings were undertaken by monks, who decorated their monasteries alongside illuminating manuscripts. The painters and illuminators made their own pigments from ground natural materials. Their themes were mainly historical and biblical or geometrically decorative. The apothecary prepared medication according to a carefully studied prescriptions that were passed down the generations. It was one of the few prof professions that was not organized into guilds. The production of medic medicaments was quite hard work and a great responsibility. The apothecary had uh, had to have studied at the university and would be schooled not only in Latin but also in Greek. Had to be able to carefully measure out precise dosages of medication and to ensure the ingredients were always available. If there was no apothecary in town, there would be the monastery infirmary. And if that was not available, people turned to the services of herb women, lay herbalists, quack healers, or medicasters called charlatans. Their methods of healing were controversial because, in making lotions and potions, they made use not only of herbs but of spells, amulets, and sometimes even very unusual raw materials such as a frog poison or hanged man's finger. Just the priests were among the elite in, me in medieval society, a little medieval society, and among the few who had any education. Village priests were less educated, aided, educated than those of the larger parishes. They could barely read or write and had no library, and learned the liturgy by heart. They were none too well off, typically working in the fields and ra or raising livestock, like lay farmers. They were not celibate, enjoyed folk entertainment and games, dancing and going to the tavern. As time went on, looser morals and educational discipline spread to the towns and monasteries. By contrast, the priests in the larger parishes and towns owned more property, and with the exception of service to God, did not have to resort to any manual work. The duties of the priest encompassed preparation and serving of mass, hearing confessions, confessions, taking care of the church, its operation and decoration, visiting the poor and the sick, arranging charity collections, collecting dues, conducting baptisms, weddings, last rites, and funerals. Prostitution. In Bohemia, the brothel was called a habas whorehouse, or house of shame, but not a brothel as such. Prostitutes were simply whores. The profession encompassed several categories. The most deprived prostitutes were homeless women who provided services in the streets. Others visited their customers in their homes disguised as bread sellers. Yet, <laughs> did someone order a sausage pizza? <laughs> Yet others were available to noble and royal courts. There were those who proffered their services in brothels of various price categories, whose clients were townsmen, officials, and nobles, or conversely, the most menial clientele, in the most downmarket establishments. 
Brothels were run not only by townspeople, but even by the spiritual leader or prelates. For example, the parish priest of the Church of St. Giles under... Often a brothel was directly connected to the bathhouse. During the Hussite Wars, many brothels were abolished, but boomed again soon afterwards. Their legalization was also helped by the Church of Rome, which considered prostitution a lesser evil than adultery. It speaks volumes that prostitutes accounted for almost 10% of the population of Papal Rome. Gross. There were numerous regulations and laws governing brothels in the, and the oldest profession, and even a special tax. There were even laws covering considerate test, uh, treatment of prostitutes and protecting them from violence. Yuck. Scrib. His main activity was to keep records of the ter territorial court and the meetings of the city council. He was one of the few in medieval society who knew how to read and write, making his services welcome in almost every city. He's a scrab. Shepherd. A herder's job depended on the weather, most commonly starting in April and ending in the autumn. They took the entrusted herd or flock, it was rarely their own, more commonly, they were hired to supervise the grazing of others' livestock for a fee, from pasture to pasture, sleeping in rudimentary huts or shelters. Over the summer, they stayed out in the pastures, returning to the village when the first frost set in. Life far away from other people forced the her herders to become adept at healing themselves and their animals. So when there was no apothecary to hand, folk would turn to the shepherd. In the Middle Ages, smuggling was regarded as taking any goods in or out of a town without paying export or import duties. Smugglers had to know alternate routes and how to avoid the tax collectors. When smuggling, through the gates, they made use of false bottomed vehicles or baskets, or even resorted to climbing over the walls by night. Contraband included fabrics, spices, wine, and other less freely available goods subject to high taxation. Stonemasons were engaged in the quarrying and dressing of the stone. Their activities included quarrying stone blocks from the rock face, splitting them into smaller pieces, grinding, cutting, polishing, and dressing them to make building blocks uh, or vault elements. The first mention of an organized stone stonemasons guild in Bohemia dates from the 14th century. The patron saints of quarriers and stonemasons are St. Roque, St. Rock <laughs> and St. Joseph, and in places also St. Barbara and St. Procopius. Stoneworking found applications mainly in the construction industry, obviously. Mason's Mark The Mason's Mark was a graphic symbol, though not the maker's signature, on the surface of a finished stone piece. The number of finished and marked pieces determined the payment due. Each mason either attained his mark or had it uh, allocated to him at a particular point in his apprenticeship, and then kept it for life. Swordsmiths and armorers. Swordsmiths were originally blacksmith cultures, specializing in blades for swords, knives, daggers, and other handheld uh, sidearms. In the 14th century, the making of armor began to specialize and separate out from the blacksmith's craft. Specialist, pro uh, specialist professions came into being. Armorers, platesmiths, and bassinetiers, who not only produced but also sold their wares. As regards the, uh, the rep, the, oh, sorry. As regards the weapons, there were new specialized professions. The swordsmith, the bladesmith, Fletcher, Aerosmith, and in later centuries, the gunsmith, Boyer or shieldsmith, making wooden and metal shields. I like metal shields. Metal shields are dope. The price of a complete suit of armor was very high, affordable only to wealthy noblemen. Those who could not afford a complete suit of armor would have only partial metal armor, and would rely on their agility for protection in combat. Too bad you fucking force everyone to not be agile. Not much agility in this game. There's really not. The controls don't allow for it. 
the way you move, it doesn't allow for actual agil agility to be utilized properly. I mean, Taylor and Draper. Until the 13th century, the tanners sold their wares for processing to suitors and cobblers. Cloth was made by weavers, but traded by drapers, who also often cut and sold it by the cubit, the length of the forearm. Only later, the high Middle Ages, did tailors sew cut pieces into garments. Simple garments were sewn by women themselves for their families. It was an issue to make sure the garments were well sewn, since they were inherited and would often last for decades with minor repairs. By the beginning of the 14th century, people in larger cities were paying even more heed to fashion. A tailor would begin to, uh, to specialize in only one kind of garment. Hence, we find coat makers, hoister, hoiser, hosiers, hosiers, hood makers, gantiers, hatters, and cape makers. Why weren't there capes in the game? <sighs> No, I couldn't I wear- why was there no option to just wear my fucking hood like a normal hood instead of have it tucked in? That's what I've been fucking wondering the entire game. And coat makers. Why can't I have an actual coat? And hatters! Eh, you're fine. Maybe. Kinda. And those who did alterations and repairs to old clothes. In a town the size of Rate, the tailor had to turn his hand to general purpose work. Tanner. The tanner was a craftsman who prepared and treated animal skins, after which he passed them onto the cobblers, saddlers, or other craftsmen for making footwear, garments, bags, wineskins, etc. It was not a pleasant job because the skin had to be quickly scraped of its fat and conserved to stop it going off, which was done by immersing in, in urine. Ew. Ew. In view of the unsavory smell produced by their trade, tanners settled on, on the outskirts of town and belonged to the same reviled group as executioners, knackers, and prostitutes. Because they soaked it in piss! They have their hands in piss! All day, it's just piss! Piss hands! Ew! What happens when they sweat and they want to wipe their forehead? Well, guess my face is smelling like piss today. Uh oh, oops, some of it got in my mouth. I wonder whose piss that was. <laughs> to turn hide into a material for making shoes or clothing, after removal from the animal, it must first be thoroughly soaked in water. Often softened, it is fleshed. The residual gore and membranes are scraped off with a long, dull paring knife. In order to rid the hide of fur, it had to be soaked in lime water or rubbed with slake lime, then scudded. Sc uh, ah, the, yeah, that, that shit, just, the, the fucking lime shit that they got, it's like fucking powerful as fuck. It was then tanned using alum by a courier with fish oil by Kamwasa. Or with tannins, dealt with by the tanner, from oak, beech, or other tree bark. During this whole lengthy process, the hide softened, was stopped from decomposing, and optionally turned a different color. At the end of the process, the hides were submerged for a few weeks in vats or pits full of urine. <coughs> the leather dust produced was then dried and could be surface treated, painted, or polished. Wow, such interesting techniques. I will keep that in mind. And I will also have a vet of piss. Just just a piss, piss vet. Just to collect all my piss over the fucking years. Just to piss in there. Soak up some fucking hides with piss. <laughs> Wait, do the... <laughs> no, um... Did they have anybody who just, uh, were they just like, yo, if anyone wants to take a piss, you can do it over here in these buckets. This is a piss bucket. I want to touch a piss. How do they get so much fucking piss? Those giant ass fucking things just 
full of yellow ickies and floating bits of yuck. <laughs> They're just a fucking outhouse for people to piss in. Shit, they don't even need a fucking piss in the vats. All they have to do is piss on the dudes and they'll just fucking wring that piss out of their shirts and just drip it all right into the fucking vat. And then they'll use their fucking shirt to cool off their goddamn head. <laughs> <coughs> Gross. Yucky. <laughs> Taverns, inns, and innkeepers. The Czech word for tavern, hospoda, hospita, may originate from the Latin hospice, guest, hospitium, hospitality, shelter. Though the more likely uh, etymology is from the old Slavonic gospod, gospolja, the master of the house. Alehouses were an integral part of all medieval villages. Originally, beer was drawn in what was called the Math House, an area on the ground floor of a townhouse whose owner was has had brewing rights. While special purpose taverns and inns came along later. These served as places for social events, meetings, trading, and lodgings. Some inns had rooms for overnight guests and special tables, stables, and spaces for carriages. These were called wagoners, uh, wagoners' inns, and were located out of town at crossroads and along trade routes. The seating was more often outdoors than indoors. It was said of Wenceslas IV that he was fond of visiting taverns and alehouses to eavesdrop on what the locals had to say about him, and to check that the owners were complying with his edicts. In the medieval ages, no one took exception to alcohol. The Germans, Russians, and Czechs in particular were Europe's fabled drinkers. There was a formal curfew at dusk, or when the night watchman began his rounds, although drinking and feasting often went on until the early morning hours. In Kingdom Come Deliverance, we have tried to keep the image of medieval taverns faithful to surviving records. All right, breakfast is ready, and I need to poo, so I'll be right, I'll be right back, fellas. Thank you all so much for being here. I appreciate you staying. And I'm sorry about all the pings, <laughs> but it was worth it because I figure it, it helped me figure out everything that was going on. Sorry again. Be right back. Enjoy the music. those of you watching live, if you're watching in post, I'm sorry, you have to bring your own music to the table.
me one. Yeah. I'm back, but I have food, so I'm eating. Ale for me. God save, what can I do for you? Might as well eat uh, in the game too. My dude's getting hungies. Give him a freaking. Mmm. Yummy. Fuck it. <laughs> it's enough to wash it all down, baby. Hell yeah. I'm gonna avail for me. Grandma made a uh, scrambled eggs. I like scrambled eggs, but I don't like uh, eating bit by bit. I prefer to like save the the yolk for last, especially when it's paired with like um, some fried potatoes or some shit. Grandma makes this uh, these potatoes and adds like some spam to it too. We've got a little meat seeds and it's pretty tasty. Especially when you eat them all together with the egg. Egg yolk, I mean. I especially like it when scrambled eggs have it so where when the yolk um, is cut or crushed it uh, it oozes out yolk 
And I really like it when it gets all over the mashed potatoes. Such a good flavor. I'll have a beer. And it looks so pretty, just One ale, so please. smoothly. Hell yeah, dude. Alright. Back to the codex. It was, uh, the three orders of mankind, yeah? <coughs> The Three Orders of Mankind A notion of an ideal social order that was prevalent primarily in the 10th to 13th centuries. The basic principles of this system was that each person had a God-given place in the world that contributed to the welfare of mankind as a whole, thus ensuring u universal unity and balance. The most extensive component of society consisted of those who worked uh, laboratories, whose purpose was to engage in crafts and cultivating the earth. Then came the fighters, bellators, which originally compromised, uh, comprised mostly the nobility and their retinues, whose task was to protect society and oversee compliance with worldly laws. <laughs> Lastly, there were those who prayed, orators, i.e. the clergy, who were concerned with the matter with matters of faith and caring for the souls of the others to lead them to salvation the formulation of the concept is most often credited to the french bishop aldebaran of leon <coughs> aldebaran of leon the concept of the three orders gradually became less convincing to a large extent because it was not capable uh, with transition between the classes while the development of cities in particular was accompanied by the emergence of relatively large influential groups of burghers, who did not fit into this original division of society. <clears throat> town Garrison Maintaining law and order in the medieval town was the job of the bailiff. From the 14th century onward, the function was taken over by the catchpole, then night watchmen and guards on the towers. The catchpole along with the bailiff, the executioner, or their henchmen also carried out the punishment of transgressors. <coughs> they were not, however, allowed to enter freehold dwellings, the places and houses of the nobility, the ruling class, nor church buildings or the university, a fact students took advantage of. <coughs> Order within the city also had to be upheld by the townsfolk themselves. They were obligated to report not only any crime, but, just like the night watchmen, to call out the hours and warn of fire, flood, or tempest. <clears throat> For safety, it was forbidden to wander at night with any open flame, uh, torch or candle, into any castles, chambers, stables, barns, or baths. Only lanterns could be used. So why the fuck couldn't I use lanterns? Why was I forced to use a torch? I want lanterns. Why are other people able to use lanterns? 
Lanterns look cool. <clears throat> to keep the peace at night, all taverns had to shut at sunset. In the medieval city, military service was entrusted to either hired professionals or the townspeople themselves. Every healthy adult male had to serve at least a few days a year in the civic guard. The city walls being divided and allocated in sections to each district or trade. And it was here that they mustered wh whenever an alarm was raised. In practice, the wealthy burghers brought their way out of serving in the militia, leaving other men to take their turn. And these poorer men welcomed the extra inc income. Thus, gradually forming a professional municipal gendarmerie. Weird word. <clears throat> Each man had to procure the armor and weapons needed for serving in the guards and the militia, unless his guild did so. Only the rich cities could afford to have a public issue armory. <clears throat> The right to bear arms outside of duty was reserved for townsmen of sufficient means. Within the city walls, a simple melee weapon, dagger or knife, had to suffice. Only the really wealthy townsmen wore swords, taking after the nobility. <coughs> Wine grower. Oh, that's right. There is no music because I did this. Unless... Hmm. I wonder what happens if I do this. Oh! <coughs> so it's still going to show in post, hopefully. Just not the music. Coolio. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. I, I need to get water. I'm doing that <coughs> too much. Too many dad noises. I'll be back in a jiff. I got water. <laughs> wine grower, finally. Let's buy, let's get back into it, babies. In Bohemia, wine growing began to spread from the 10th century onwards, due especially to liturg liturgical reasons. <clears throat> Between the 11th and 13th centuries, vineyards were mainly for monasteries and the nobility. 
generally in similar places to where we find wine grown today. What? I was getting water. Oh, you are you here? Yeah, John showed up. <laughs> I had his mic. Alright, from the top. Between the 11th and 13th centuries, vineyards were mainly for monasteries and the nobili nobility, generally in similar places to where we find wine grown today, mainly in South Moravia. Due to the more favorable clima climactic conditions, Vineyards could, for a period, thrive even in Bohemia, but later, after a global cooling period, they died off again. Taking care of vines kept vint vintners uh, occupied all year round. <clears throat> the vintage harvest taking place from October to no November, depending on the weather. <clears throat> Wine tended to be grown in places unsuitable for the cultivation of other plants, such as on rocky south-facing slopes. It could take three or four years to establish a vineyard, and it would be good for 30 to 40 years. <clears throat> the grapes were harvested and put into vats where they were crushed by treading. White grapes were pressed immediately after crushing and the juice kept in wooden barrels, tarred and sanitized with sulfur, where the wine was left to ferment. Red grapes were crushed, the seeds removed, and left to ferment in open vats stirred regularly. This produced what is termed the mash, and after a few days this was pressed and juiced uh, and the juice poured into barrels. King Charles IV was a great wine lover who imported grape vines from France together with wine growing know how, and granted numerous privileges to vint vintners. During the early Middle Ages, agriculture and the rapid growth of towns took its toll on the forest, with massive clearing. There was no reforestation done in those days, so in the 15th century, some areas had even less forest covered than today, while the towns themselves were surrounded by zones of outright devastation. Lodging, logging was done by woodcutters. Their basic tool was a large single-sided axe on a long handle or, sh or haft while various wooden ledges, uh, wedges and hammers were used to split the lumber. Transport of lumber was from distant areas was difficult, which led to using navigable waterways, down which the lumber was left to do drift freely. <coughs> Get it, oh. Oh. Abbots of Sasso Monastery. A chronological list of abbots and superiors of, of the monastery from its origins up until 1405, the year after the name indicates when from. <coughs> oh. Ooh. Let's 
St. Procopius, 1035, Vitus, 1053. You get the chance to meet John and Nevlis in the game. Well, Peter is only spoken of, but not present. Hmm. Cool. Albert Fulv of Habsburg. Hab, hab, Habs. Habsburg. Whoa. 1909. Oh, okay. Wait, that is June. September 19th, 1377 to September 14th, 1404. <coughs> Damn. Almost made it to his birthday. Albert IV of Habsburg, Habsburg was an Austrian count, son of Albert III, with whom he fought against King Wenceslas IV beginning, beginning in 1394. He also uh, had disputes with Prokop of Luxembourg over Czech Austrian borders. Av Nine eighty two ten thirty seven. A scientist and historian of Persia, one of the fathers of medicine. <coughs> he studied from childhood learning logic, metaphysics, and astronomy. He devoted most of his time to medicine and philosophy, and even experimented with remedies on his own body. He was always surrounded with students with whom he enjoyed debating. He was also a keen observer of the night sky. During his lifetime, he wrote at least 450 works, of which some 240 had survived to this day, including 150 books concerning philosophy and 40 on medicine. The remainder are astronomy, alchemy, geography and geology, psychology, Islamic theology, logic, mathematics, physics, and poetry. His theories and discoveries fascinated not only scholars of the neighboring countries, but also the whole of Europe. The Czech reform preacher, Master John Hughes, also referred to Avicenna's writings. Hmm. Charles the Fourth, blur blur blur, thirteen to sixteen, the blur blur blur, the blur the blur the blur. Charles IV of Luxembourg, born Wenceslas, son of King John of Luxembourg, was the second member of Luxembourg dynasty to become King of, Bohe of Bohemia from 1346 to 1378, and the first to attain the title Holy Roman Emperor from 1355 to 1378. <coughs> he held many other titles besides, Margrave of Moravia, Count of Luxembourg, King of Italy, King of the Romans, and King of Burgundy. Renowned for his diplomatic skills and erudition, he actively endeavored to consolidate his position and, and assure the survival of his line in Europe, especially in Bohemia, Moravia, and Germany. He was well versed in several languages, and at the French court he was tutored by none other than the, little, none other than the future pope, Clement the Sixth. I think. During his reign, Prague and the lands of the Bohemian crowd, crown underwent a major transformation, becoming a powerful political, economic, and cultural center. center. For this reason, his, this period of his reign is known as the Golden Age. He initiated the construction of many superb edifices, which thus bears his name, including Charles University, Charles Bridge, and Karlstein Castle. He was keen to emphasize the role of religious faith in society. He renewed the cults of St. Wenceslas, St. Sigismund, and St. Vitus, consecrating various church buildings to them, among others Prague Cathedral. He married four times and had thirteen children, most of whom died in infancy. Infancy, the most illustrious of his offspring were of his offspring were his sons Wenceslas and Sigismund, who both became rulers over the lands of the Bohemian crown. Wow. Well, yeah. Q 
cumins. Ew. The cumins first arrived in Shacklands in 1260, under the leadership of the Hungarian crown, Prince Stephen. Stefan. They fought against Bishop Bruno and the army of the Austrian lords, which they thoroughly vanquished. The Cumans appeared for the second time in uh, in the 1270s, when they defeated the army of King Priamizio Utkar and went on to pillage Moravia. The last invaded the Czech lands under Sigismund of Luxembourg, who could afford no better mercenaries than the Cumans. Estimates speak of several thousand fighters. One of the places that succumbed to their ravages was Silver Scalitz, the birthplace of our, ga of our game's hero. Heinrich III von Rosenberg. Ooh, that's a pretty sword. This is a pretty weird sword with you over there. Hmm. Henry the Third of Rosenberg, the only son of Aldrich, Aldrich the First of Rosenberg, was Prague Burgrave in the years 1396 to 1398 and 14,000, and 1404. He also held the position of Lord of the Upper Castle in Bohemian Krumlau, Bohemian Krumlau, and was a member of the noble opposition group known as the League of Lords. He took part in the capture and imprisonment of Wenceslas IV in 1394, and again in 1402. Between 1389 and 1409, he held the position of executioner, as recorded in the Luxembourg, uh, Rosenberg Records, Book of Executions. Rosenberg Lord's Book of Executions. Around 1400... Henry was presented with a statue of the Madonna and child crafted Henry was presented with a statue of the Madonna and child crafted in the parlor workshop now known as the Crumla Madonna Madonna of Crumla Jaroslav of Bezmira and Benusyov Jaroslav of Bezmir aka Benish was appointed in a an auxiliary bishop of Sirepta by Pope Boniface the Ninth in 1394, at which time he was a Bachelor of Theology, then a very high level of education. He probably completed his studies later, sometime around 1403 to 1409. He became an Inquisitor sometime before 1408. In 1409 to 1410, he defended the position of Prague Archbishop Zibanyak of, of Hasenberg and his actions against the teachings of John Wycliffe before the Roman Curia. During his career as Inquisitor, he came into conflict with John Hughes and his, and his progressive ideas. He later participated in the trial of Bologna, Bologna, that resulted in the condemnation and burning of John Wycliffe's books. He was also named as a witness in, the, in a document demanding a harsher denunciation of John Hughes for not attending the Bologna trial, although he himself had requested it. <laughs> we know little of Jaroslav at this point, and it is assumed he was living abroad. The Papal Inquisition had been operating in Bohemia since 1257, when two French uh, Franciscan inquisitors arrived at the request of Cru King Otakara II, and continued intermittently until the Hussite Revolution. In Kingdom Come Deliverance, we decided to make use of Jaroslav as a very active inquisitor, Although the period of the game is somewhat earlier than the time that he was appointed and active as a papal inquisitor, according to historical sources. As a titular bishop, however, he could have presided over trials if it was required. Hmm. Who's this nerd? Jobst of Moravia. <clears throat> 1354 to 1411. Very specific date of 1411. 
Jobst of Moravia was Margrave of Moravia from 1375, and Elector of Brandenburg from 1388. He also held the throne of the King of the Romans, although he did so for a mere 15 weeks until his death, 1410-11. to He was the son of John Henry of Luxembourg, and the nephew of Emperor Charles IV. He achieved his standing in Europe due to military and political intrigues, and primarily against members of his own dynasty, particularly Wenceslas IV, against whom he rebelled along with the Moravian forces in the so-called Magravate Wars. Magraviate Wars. He initially supported Sigismund of Luxembourg's efforts to seize the Bohemian crown, but in 1403 he began opposing him, and together with Albert IV, Duke of Austria, took part in a rebellion against him. His previous support for Sigismund was probably motivated more by self-interest. It ensured him future influence as long as it seemed that Wenceslas would be depo deposed and Sigismund, or even Jobst himself, would take his place. His campaign against Wenceslas won him and other nobles many privileges. Then in 1402, when the situation changed, he rebelled against Sigismund and was even instrumental in liberating Wenceslas from cap captivity. We don't know whether the change was due to cunning or conscience, but to the end of his life he remained surprisingly loyal to Wenceslas IV. Towards the end of his life, he even stood against Sigismund in the election of King of the Romans, and won. He didn't enjoy the crown for long, though, and died shortly after. Jobst was not only politically astute, but also a very thrifty governor. Many rulers, including Sigismund himself, were financially indebted to him. In, this, in his day, it was said that it was Jobst, and not either Wenceslas or Sigismund, who was the true uncrowned sovereign of Bohemia. At the time our game takes place, however, he was in debt up to his ears. John Youth. Water time. John Hughes, C. Thirteen seventy to six seven. Oh, June. No, no, no. July sixth, fourteen fifteen. John Hughes was a priest and thinker, and one of the most important Czech religious reformers and preachers. His works, inspired by the theological writings of John Wycliffe, played a key <coughs> played a key role in underpinning the essence of the Reformation. As of 1398, he worked and dissem disseminated his teachings at Prague University, but as early as 1403, German professors there labeled him as a, a heretic. Six years later, up to 20,000 doctors, masters, and students were forced to leave Prague University as a result of theological disputes. From 1402, Hughes preached at the Bethlehem Chapel in Prague where all sermons were del delivered not in Latin, but in Czech. This place became the center of the Reformation in Bohemia. Because of his controversial relationship with the Church and opinions on Catholic ethics, Hughes was persecuted and finally convicted of heresy by the Council of Constance, for which he was burnt at the stake. The followers of the reformist idea rallied to get together after the events of, uh, at Constance leading to the beginning of the Hussite Wars, from 1420 to 13, 1434. John II of Liechtenstein. In 1386 through 1412 is where he lived. A member of the Council of the Moravian Margrave, Jobst of Luxembourg, who was one of only a few Moravian lords, did not fight against the king alongside Jobst. The Liechtensteins were a wealthy family, owning estates in Styrian and Lower Austria regions from the 13th century onwards, their main seat being Mikulov. The Liechtenstein princes were in close allegiance, uh, alliance with the Habsburgs and L Luxembourgs. In the war against Sigismund, John of L 
Lechtenstein supported Wenceslas, helping to rescue him from captivity, but by doing so fell out of favor with the Austrian dukes, who confiscated his estates around the Danube River and took him prisoner. After the death of Wenceslas, the Lechtensteins aligned with Sigismund. John of Ginstein. You see, uh, people show up and then, like, I start thinking about how I'm reading and then, like, I start messing up a lot. Especially because my voice, uh, just really wants to stop, <laughs> you know? John of Genstein. He lived from t the... Oh, December 27th, 1350, through June 17th, 1400. John of Dent Genstein, Jan Zydrosavra, was Bishop of Meissen and Chancellor to King Wenceslas IV from 1376 and Archbishop of Prague from 1379. A serious illness during the worst outbreak of plague in Bohemia altered his disposition from that of a carefree man to a devout servant of the church. This did not meet with the approval of Wenceslas, however, who sent him to prison in Karlstein castles and, in 1394, removed him from the office of Chancellor, which led to further conflicts between the church and the king. Subsequently, John finally gave up his office in 1396. His many writings include sermons, commentaries, tractates, essays, essays and poetry. Conrad Keister. <laughs> Keister. <clears throat> He's Conrad Booty. Thir from, he lived from 1366 to C. 1405. Conrad Keister of Echstra was a military engineer and supporter of King Wenceslas IV, and the author of Bellefortis, of Manual on the Military Arts, which is the oldest example of Kreisbusch to appear in the Bohemian territories. Written in Latin hexameter, the book consists of 140 parchments with somewhat incomprehensible text. It was accompanied by elaborate drawings by Keister himself. The book must have been very popular at the time of, it, of its writing, as testified by the fact that more than 30 manuscripts had survived to this day. Conrad Keister's loyalty to the Bohemian king is attested by a number of drawings in the Gro Gotten, uh, Got Gottingen manuscript. Ah, why did my brain just fuck up right there? Gottingen. Gottingen. In particular, a depiction of the king's royal tent with a number of the symbols typical for Wenceslas IV, such as a uh, torse, wreath, and the letter W. The main text is prefaced by a, prolong, uh, a prologue and a long dedication to the king of Germany, Rex Romanorum, Rupert IV of the Palatinate, Palatinate which was probably an attempt to ingratiate himself into his services. Unfortunately, we will never know why he did not dis dedicate his work to Wenceslas IV. The ten chapters of Bellafortis are devoted to weaponry, siege warfare, and the use of various techniques for besieging ma uh, towers and castles. They also include prescriptions for making medicine and instructions for preparing baths, information about torture devices, and even an illustration and depiction, a description of a chastity belt. The book concludes with an epicedium, a personal elegy written by Kaiser himself, Kaiser, with his portrait and personal details, parents and dates of birth, as well as a horoscope from May 1402. Bellafortis is an adroit compilation of military engineering and technology well known in Kaiser's uh, epoch. The author based his book on, mari uh, on various previous works, including De Mirabilibus Mundi and Liber Ignium by Marcus Gracious. 
Some parts are also based on personal experience. <laughs> I call him Keister. <laughs> Matthew of Jano. Mm, I don't know what this is. This hurts my head. What? Matthew of Jano was an intellectual writer, preacher, and theologian. He was born in Jano, a village in South Bohemia. He began his studies in Prague and completed them at the university in Paris, where he became a master of liberal arts. He never completed the study of theology he had begun. Following his return to Prague, he held a number of church offices and became the conf confessor of Archbishop John of Genstein. His intellectual works concerning, concerned mostly with the study of the Bible, emphasizing Christ and the Eucharist, while on the other hand, he criticized, criticized some subsequent non-biblical stipulations of the church, which he regarded as lacking the authority of scripture, and sometimes contradicting it. He also criticized the palpal schism of the time, the disunity of the church, and the excessive cult of sacred images of, and saints. For some of his ideas and teachings, he was su suspected of heresy, but he cleared himself of such, such accusations before the archbishop's vicar, and revised some of his opinions. Matthew is regarded as one of the most significant Czech reformers before John Hughes. Together with the preacher Conrad von Waldhusen and John Miller of Kramerath, who greatly influenced him. The entire progress of the early Czech Reformation was driven by criticism of the church's material conditions, appeals to personal devotion, and frequent communion. Matthew's work was followed by that of the important Hussai theologian uh, Jakubek of Struve, who defended the taking of the Eucharist by both means, bread and wine, even for lay people. Pope. The Pope is the supreme head of the Roman Catholic Church, Jesus Christ's deputy on earth, and cannot be removed from office. His words is regarded by the Church as infallible, equivalent in effect to the Holy Scriptures. At the time of our game, however, nothing was quite so straightforward. Due to the palpal schism that lasted from 1378 to 1417, there were for a time as many as three rival claim claimants to the throne of St. Peter, for secular rulers supported for one claimant or the other was often less a question of faith than of political convenience. Uh, Pope Benedict the Thirteenth, I think. Benedict the Benedict the Thirteenth, born Pedro de Luna was elected antipope in, in 1394 in Avignon. He had previously withdrawn his allegiance to the Italian Pope Urban IV. Oh, no, I mean, I mean sixth. Yeah. Probably. Who represented the Catholic Church in Rome. Pope Boniface IX. 1356 to 1404. Pope Boniface IX, born Pietro Tomicelli, was pontiff from 1389. Contemporaneously with the Evignon antipopes Clement the Twelfth, I mean Eighth, and Benedict the Thirteenth, he refused to abdicate, leading not only to a continuation of the Western Schism, but also to an ever deepening rift in the Church. However, it also meant that Boniface had a growing influence in some important aspects of secular power. Well, I should call out of the world. Question mark to 1416. Rashik in Kingdom Come Deliverance Radzig. Kobla was a Bohemian German, the royal hetman of Wenceslas IV. And between 1410 and 1415, Burgrave of Fierstrap in 1403, he resided at the castle in Silber Skalitz, where he oversaw the mining of silver. 
The king was known for his generosity to the lower noble nobles who received high titles for their loyalty. Uh, Rashik Koblo was apparently one of these and probably the king's friend. In 1403, Skalitz was besieged and burned to the ground by King Sig Sigismund and his Cuman army. For his service and loyalty, to King Wenceslas IV, uh, the fourth permitted Rashik to build his own castle at Vaseli in Standing on this site today is Chateau Camorini. Wow. He was killed in 1416 in a tavern in Kutnahora by a mob of miners, incited by preachers a year after the burning of John Hughes. They seized them in the inn where they were staying, cut their bodies into pieces, and threw them out onto the streets, where the mob vigorously stomped on their remains, and then went in merry song to the home of the preacher, to be praised for the act that they had been encouraged to commit. This occurred when Rashik was there to collect taxes for the king, which is odd because six years earlier, he had already, uh, he had apparently been a robber knight and soldiers had been dispatched against him as a scourge of the land. Sources are not clear as to why he was later reha rehabilitated for services to the king. St. Procopius, late 10th century to blah blah blah. St. Procopius of Sassau was a lay priest, hermit, and co founder and first abbot of Sassau. Monastery. He was canonized in 1204. According to hagiography, he was educated uh, at a school in Vesual. He was married and had a son, but decided to become a priest. He spent some time with the Benedictines in Brevnov, before embarking on the life of a hermit. In the Sassel region, he gathered a group of men around him which, with whom he founded a monastery of the religious order of St. Benedict in the 13th in the. 1030s, becoming its first abbot. Many legends have arisen about St. Procopius in which the hermit does battle with demons and performs exorcisms. In one, he puts a demon to work, dragging his plow, digging out the so-called devil's furrow. He was thus often depicted with a tied and bound devil by his feet. Sometimes he was pictured with a crutch and mitre and from the 17th century onwards, he was represented holding a book and a cross. The Sasso Monastery houses the cave of Procopius, which was hollowed into the cliff wall in the shape of a Greek cross, and the saint is said to have spent several years as a hermit in it in solitary prayer. Sigismund of Luxembourg. From this to that... <laughs> Sigismund of Luxembourg, son of Charles IV, was King of Hungary and Croatia from 1387, King of Germany from 1411, King of Bohemia from 1419, and King of Il Italy from 1431. He was also Prince of Silesia, Silesia from 1419 Margrave of Lusatia, and most notably Holy Roman Emperor between 1433 and 1437. At an early age, he was sent to be educated at the Hungarian court, quickly mastering the tough conditions of politics. Like other members of his family, he was uh, ab abducted at least once, in his case by the Hungarian nobility. Having lost faith in the Hungarian nobility, he turned his attention to Bohemia and became engaged in hostilities with his half-brother, Wenceslas. Some of the Bohemian nobility welcomed Sigismund, hoping he would rid them of their ineffective monarch, while others sided with Wenceslas, resulting in long-lasting wars, in the course of which Sigismund and his Hungarian army, consisting in no small part of Cuman mercenaries, repeatedly pillaged Bohemia, often with the help of the Bohemian and especially Moravian lords themselves. Sigismund fought not only to seize his brother's throne, but also against the Hussites, 
with the aim of seizing the imperial crown. He regarded himself as the defender of Christianity, and in 1409 even founded the Order of the Dragon to wage war against all enemies of the Christian faith. One of the later members of the Order was the infamous Vlad the Impaler, inspiration for the fictional Dracula. What? He was part of Order of the Dragon? That's fucking cool. Uh, I guess Dracula. Draconian. After the death of Wenceslas, Sigismund brought to Bohemia four unsuccessful crusades after the Hussites. He died soon after the signing of the Compacts, a set of agreements with the Reformers guaranteeing freedom of religious belief to every inhabitant of the lands of Bohemia and Moravia. Vlad the Impaler was a fucking ruthless killer who would bathe in the bloods of his, of his enemies, I think, and put it, uh, uh, allegedly, and put the heads of, this, of his enemies just on spikes everywhere he went, basically. Fucking chopped them to bits and ate them. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Don't quote me on that. <laughs> Sir Mark Vard von Olitz. He was the hetman or governor of Prague, who, much like those members of the nobility disgruntled with the reign of Wenceslas IV, saw in Sigismund of Luxembourg a better potential king. Their motivation had more to do with money and power. Wenceslas offered them no prospects, while supporting Sigismund promised them a better future position in society. So Sir Schmiel Flaschka, Schmiel Flaschka of Pardubis and Rackmark, was a Czech nobleman, the nephew of the first Czech archbishop, Ernest Arnost of Pardubis. He is known mainly as a writer. He received his bachelor's degree at the university in Prague in 1367. In the 1380s, he was in dispute with Wenceslas IV, trying to prevent Pardubis, Pardubis from falling into the hands of the king as an Eschiot. Although he lost in 1390, he inherited the Pardubits and Reichenberg. Yeah, Reichenberg. States, and six years later he was appointed supreme scribe of the provincial, provincial records. From 1403 he held, position, he held the position of hetman of the castle region and was a member of the League of Lords. He died in fighting against the Kutna Hora, Kutnenberg, allies of Wenceslas IV. He wrote allegorical verses, for example the poem New Council, featuring an assembly of animals representing conservative views on how the king should govern. He also penned aphorisms, proverbs, and satire. A street in Pardubis bears his name, and his work is still read by students of Czech literature. Mm-hmm. <laughs> My arm is hurting. I don't know why. The, Ravn the Ranov family. One of the oldest and most notable of Czech aristocratic dynasties. The family expanded into numerous branches over generations, such as the Lords of Duba, Berka, the Lichtenbergs, Kirznitz of Rono, and so on. So on. In the 13th and 14th century, centuries, the family split into the Lords of Lipa, the Lichtenbergs, the Lords of Duba, and the Lords of Klingenstein, and more. The oldest known member of the dynasty was the late 12th century Schmiel Schwierig of Trian. His descendants carried a high office at the royal court, thus acquiring considerable tracts of land, from which they acquired the family name from Rono in the Zdrava region in the Nyesa River Valley in present-day Poland. Rono Castle of the same name, south of Szefra was built only at the end of the 14th century. The Rono family is represented by one of the Kingdom Come Deliverance characters, Hainish of Lipa. Hmm. 
Henry of Lepa from 1275 question mark to 2609. Henry the first of Lepa was one of the founders of the noble family, which took its name from the settlement of Lepa. Lepa today, shout Lepa. He held various positions of high office at the royal court. Sub-Chamberlain, Marshal of Bohemia, and Provincial Hetman of Bohemia, and Moravia simultaneously. In 1315, he was charged with the conspiracy for drafting a document against the king and thrown in prison. He was released half a year later thanks to support of part of the nobility and the Dowager Queen, Elizabeth Riqueza of Poland, who was his, long life, his lifelong partner. This situation forced John of Luxembourg to launch a campaign with German troops against the Czech nobility. The conflict came to an end in 1318. He spent the last years of his life in Brno, where he had established his own court. The coat of arms of the Lords of Lipa consists of a cross made of three branches. Henry had three daughters, Clara, Clara. Margaret, Margaret, and Catherine, Catherine. Catherine. And four sons, Henry the Iron One, John, Berthold, and Schneck. They took all held positions of high office. John Birdie died after 1393. John Jessick, father of young Lord John Prather, Hans Capen, oh, was a Moravian lord in 1349. He became lord of the Hanqvias Estates in 1356, lord of Palna Castle, which he acquired in exchange for Sloop Castle, Parkenstein, and in 1369, lord of Ratte, Ratte, where he built a new parish church and renamed the lower castle Parkenstein. His son John was still a minor when he when he died, so the property was administered by his relatives. It did not pass back into the la the hands of the rightful heir until 1412. Jessic was the first of the Lords of Lipa to hold the moniker Bertie. Yeah. John Piazza Hans Capen. <laughs> Sir Hans Capen. Capone. The underage son of John Piazza and, and Halvega of Dubao. After the death of his father, his family, the Lords of Lipa, his uncle Jagrat Henry, his son Hainish, and his brothers became his guardians. Young Lord did not take possession of Rate and hereditary estate in Polna until 1412. Soon afterward, he entered political life, and he held positions in the provincial offices. After the imprisonment of Master John Hughes, he signed a petition in his defense, but during the Hussite Wars, he was initially on the side of the League of Lords against the Hussites in a few minor battles. In 1419, he took part in a battle against the Hussite, uh, Hussites at Kran. Apparently, due to the influence of his close neighbor, Lachit of Kramla, there are no records indicating he took part in the war later. His son was Hanuk Pesha, who achieved high office in the Kingdom of Bohemia, becoming Royal Hofmeister of Min and Mincemaster. Sir Hainus Blap, following the death of Yenrik of Pesha. Henry the Third of Perkins Perkstein. In fourteen oh two, Hainish of Lipa in Kingdom Come Hainish of Lipa became the guardian of the former's son Jam in Kingdom Come Deliverance Hans Capon. And thus the acting governor of the surrounding province. He completed the re the construction of Perkstein and its fortifications and the local church of Saint Matthew which contains a shrine to his family. When Sigismund of Luxembourg invaded a burned scallet, the towns Burgrave, Rasig, Koblia, Rasik Koblia, and the survivors of the raid found refuge with Hainish. 
Hainish subsequently took action against scattered groups of brigands and cumans. His relationship with the king was peculiar, to say the least. Judging by often contradictory sources, it appears that in 1410, crown forces descended on the town of Ratai in Hainish's domain, probably after he became a robber baron and rebel, who may also have participated in the siege of Jilava in Moravia. Nevertheless, in 1414, he became a provincial marshal and dwelt together with his wife, Marketa of Sturmberg and Spielberg Brano. We're almost done. Ooh, we're almost done. The Zoll family of Osterdeck. The story of the Zoll Yeoman family aptly illustrates the conditions that existed in Bohemia at the turn of the century. Even before the king's abduction, Bohemia was crawling with all sorts of bandit fellowships and fraternities, often led by the lower nobility. Execution records mention the Zoll family name as of 1389, when John Zoll and his father, Mikolas Zoll are mentioned as leader of the bands of brigands that perpetrated pillaging raids from their base in Osterdeck. There were sometimes joined. Uh, there were. <laughs> the, <laughs> there were sometimes joined by John's uncle Hagen from the nearby fortress of Krasis. The territory of operation consisted mostly of the trade routes between Prague, Kutna, Hora, Kutenberg and Bernischof, as well as solitary mills. In fairness, it must be added that the testimonies of individual captured bandits or their associates implicated many millers and innkeepers from the surrounding villages of receiving stolen goods from bandits or assisting them in other ways. These stolen goods were indeed varied in character. We learn from their execution, uh, from the execution books that the Zoles stole horses, cattle, and farm equipment, as well as merchandise such as cloth and barrels full of herrings. Of course, money was al also highly desirable loot. Around the turn of the century, the Zoles band seized Shawa Castle and extended their hunting ground. At the same time, they also fought with Prokop of Luxembourg in his campaign against Sigismund which nicely illustrates the attitude of the day to the criminality of the nobility. There was indeed a thin line between mercenary and bandit, very often depending on allegiances. It may have been on account of Prokop that the Zoles plundered especially the lands of Sigismund's allies from the Rosenberg family. Little wonder, then, that most of the records we have about the Zoles come from the Rosenberg's execution books, which depict them in an unflattering light. In 1401, they abducted the parish priest from a Rosenberg village, probably in the expectation of a fat ransom, or and later they further expanded their property by seizing Duba Castle, which belonged to their former allies, Duba. <coughs> The Zoll's pillaging raids were only brought to an end by the by a punitive expedition by the Prague Bishop Hair of Hasenberg Hare Castle, who conquered both Duba and Shawa. He then brought Mikolas Zoll and about fifty of his companions in captivity to Prague. John, the youngest of the Zools, was captured and executed a year later. The bishop divided the Zool's numerous properties, which included villages, woods, and farms in, among his allies, and left the family's descendants quite destitute. Shalonov Castle was reduced to ruins during the punitive raid. It passed through the hands of several court courtiers before becoming the property of Rasha Kobla in 1411. Kobla built a new seat there called the fate of Mikolas Zoll after his captivity is also interesting, because he was escorted to the gallows by none less than John Hughes, and hanged along with his comrades. 
According to Chronicles of the Time, the only concession, according to his noble status, was that he was hanged higher than the other outlaws. His body was then displayed hanging on a hook. The Chronicles mentioned that seven years later, a madman with a compulsion for burying executed convicts was wandering around Prague. Because he was unable to remove Zol's remains from the hook, he took at least one leg and left it with a female grocer who later saw to a proper burial of the body of Mikulas Zol, albeit not in one piece, <laughs> was finally laid to eternal rest behind the ch church of St. Stephen of Rival, where it was customary at the time to enter executed individuals. Hmm. The Lords of Tomberg the coat of arms of the Lords of Tomberg consisted consist of two water lily leaves argent, silver, on a field go goals, red. The dynasty dates back to 1291, when Tomberg Castle was under the administration of William, son of, then, of the then Prague Burgrave. Hrasnata of Ushitz, his Rajnata of Ushitz. His descendants later owned estates in south of e and East Bohemia, including Slatinani, Mishlemilashan, and the area around Kaslau. Some of the Tomberg lords achieved such influential posts in administration as burgrave or magistrate. Sir Divish of Tomberg. Divish Zitonberku, Sir Divish of Tomberg, owned Tomberg Castle in the years 1390 through 1415. In 1391, the castle was conquered by Divish, uh, was taken captive, and by his neighbor Havel Medic of Valdek, though we no longer know how the dispute arose between them. Due to the king's inability to settle the matter, Divish was impri imprisoned by his, in his own castle for seven long years while his young wife Stephanie attempted to raise the ransom to free him. Thanks to the help of friends, including Radzig Kobla, he was finally liberated of, and Medek was condemned for his actions as a rebel. From 1400 onward, Divish held the, the office of Prague Burgrave and in 1401 moved his seat to Prague. Meanwhile, Tomberg Castle was repaired and he gave it to his wife. Divish returned there in 1414 and in 1418 his son Oldrich governed the estate. According to some resources, Divish died in 1415, while others attest that in 1418 John Jakovsky sold him Jankov Castle, where the Tomberg family lived until 1702. Divish had three sons, Aldrich, Willem, and Mikolas, who governed Jankov from 1433 onwards. William of Tomberg and Milishin. In 1297, the head of the provincial court, the direct founder of Tomberg, of the Tomberg branch, and a direct bearer of the Hraznata coat of arms. The Hraznata family was one of the few that did not directly engage in the war against the king, so did not forfeit property. So do not forfeit property. He founded Tomberg Castle. He had two sons, Divish and Nizmizil. Wenceslas the Fourth. Wenceslas IV of Luxembourg was the son of the highly successful monarch Charles IV. He inherited the Bohemian throne and attained the German crown by election. However, Auerbeck. However, he did not inherit his father's predisposition for ruling. Already during his lifetime, he was known for being a weak, idle, and moody ruler who was afflicted with many ailments, as well as difficulties meeting his royal obligations. Despite the fact that he had been groomed for a rule since early childhood, he was crowned Bohemian King at the age of only two years. He was more interested in hunting, alcohol, 
courtesans and pleasures of the court. During his time as king, the land of the Bohemian crown underwent several wars and conflicts involving his relatives, his own brother Sigismund and his cousins, the Moravian Margraves. Vash family of Zalush and Hosenberg. A family of Bohemian nobles whose main seat was Hasenberg Castle, Little Hare, Aldrich of Valdeck, was the first to take the name in 1232. In 1335, the Zjak is the for Hare, uh huh, uh huh. Uh, of Valdeck and Zebriat purchased the Gothic castle near the village of Clappy, near Libov. Leboshovitz, from King John of Luxembourg, and renamed it Hasenberg. The German word for hair is Hass. During the Hussite Wars, the Zajic lords were on the side of the Catholics allied to Emperor Sigismund. In the 14th century, the family lost much of its property, and thereafter, historical records of it became rather scant. The Zajic family be gradually dwindled until it died out altogether in the, four in the 17th century. The best known representatives of the family included William Zajic of Valdic before 1289-9, October 1319, <coughs> who was a friend of the Permislid Elizabeth of Bohemia, mother of Charles IV whom he helped raise when he was at Krivoklat Castle. He was also one of the feudal lords from West Bohemia who accused Henry of Lipa of plotting against the king. Willem Zjajic of Valdic. William Hare of Valdic and Zjajic, son of Zbella and Zajac and Catherine of Lambeth lured during the wars in Moravia between the brother Jobst and Procopius of Luxembourg. William initially served in the army of the elder brother. Then after 1399, he fought on the side of Procopius. Once the power struggle ended, he worked as a diplomat for Jobst. Thanks to his marriage to Dorothea of Rabstein, the window of Henry of Rabstein, he acquired and pawned the estate of Zlerkovic and its forest, fortress, fortress, which the Margrave bequeathed to William in 1407. William Zajic not only spent time in Moravia, but also traveled widely, frequenting Prague, Olomouc, and Vienna, and undertaking trips to France and Brandenburg as well as going to pilgrimages to Rome and Santiago de Compostela. Santiago de Compostela. Jobst, regarding his services most highly and at the end of 1407, promoted him to the position of hetman of the Duchy of Luxembourg. Duchy. After the death of the Margrave, uh, William continued to serve Wenceslas IV, and from 1412 onwards, Sigismund of Luxembourg. These things have little tidbits uh, of sweet ass information. Um, ah. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let me see. I don't think I should read any of these, but maybe. Depends on if there's anything interesting to me.
All right, events. Abduction of Wenceslas IV. Wenceslas IV was an none too capable ruler, rather the opposite. During his reign, he was abducted several times in attempts to wrest power from him. The first time in 1394, he was taken captive in one of his residences in Berun, near Prague, and taken to Wildeberg Castle in Austria. The abduction was engineered by the opposing nobility, called the League of Lords. The Lords. In 1402, Wenceslas was abducted for a second time by his half-brother, Sigismund of Luxembourg, King of Hungary, who aspired to the Bohemian throne. With the support of the high nobility and incarcerated in Vienna, from where he managed to flee with the help of loyal nobles in November 1403. Sigismund had in the meantime brought in higher taxes on towns and monasteries. Any towns that refused to submit he conquered and ransacked. The conflict grew into a protracted civil war, which did not abate even after the death of Wenceslas. The Battle of Kosovo the Battle of Kosovo took place in June 15, 1389, between the Christian forces led by the Serbian prince, Lazar Hrebosnabal, assisted by his compatriot, the noble von Brakovic, and Bosnian king Trevkal I, against the invading armies of the Ottoman Empire, under Sultan Murad I and his sons. It was a decisive battle, Although without a clear victor, which strengthened the Ottoman position in newly conquered territories in Europe. The Battle of Nicopolis. The Battle of Nicopolis took took place on the twenty uh, the twenty fifth of September. Yeah. In thirteen ninety six, between the Hungarian king Sigismund and the Turks, led by Sultan Bayezid. Sigismund's army was made up of soldiers from France, Burgundy, Germany, England, Italy, Bohemia, Poland, and other countries. In all, it was ten to 15,000 strong. The Ottomans, who at the end of the 14th century controlled the entirety of the Balkans, numbered, uh, numbered almost 20,000. The experienced Turkish combatants rooted the Christian knights completely, routed largely because the Russian and French knights disobeyed orders, attacked the Turkish vanguard under miscon the misconception that it was the main force and were subsequently crushed. Those who didn't die on the battlefield were brutally put to death, reportedly up to 3,000 men. The wealthiest were taken prisoner and saved only by paying a ransom, which they paid over decades. When news of the defeat uh, reached Paris, no one believed it, and those who had initially spread the news were put to death by drowning for spreading malicious lies. The Ottoman victory was a triumph of Islam f over Christendom. The Turkish army represented a real threat to European countries, especially Hungary. The Conquest of Kutemberg In December 1402, during Wenceslas' in Wenceslas's imprisonment in Vienna, Sigismund attacked Kutenberg, and by the beginning of the following year, seized and ransacked the town. Kutenberg was loyal to the king and staunchly defended by its miners. When they finally surrendered, they were force-marched to Sigismund's encampment near Kölin, and made to kneel before him in the mud in subjugation. In addition, they had to pay huge sums of money in reparation even though the town and its environs had been pillaged by Hungarian soldiers. The treasury in Kutenberg held not only coins, but also precious jewels, gold, and silver. Wenceslas later estimated the wealth seized by Sigismund to be worth one million in gold ducats of, of the day. The Golden Age of Charles IV when the young son of Luke, John of Luxembourg, Charles inherited the title of Moravian Margrave, and subsequently the Czech throne, he embarked on not only economic, but also cultural development of his kingdom, a period dubbed the Golden Era. 
In 1348, Charles founded one of the oldest universities in Europe. Many cities, towns, and castles acquired new fortifications and new bridges, infrastructure, and churches were built. To strengthen his position in Europe, he made good use of political marriages, thus allying his family with prominent families in neighboring countries. He even had influence over the appoint appointment of ecclesiastical dignitaries. E ecclesiastical. Thanks to firm rule and a policy based on the alliances, he was able to keep the peace in Europe. Charles was an educated monarch, interested in the arts, which was reflected in the architecture of cities, especially Prague, where under his rule many new houses, churches, including St. Vitus Cathedral, and the city walls sprang up. The Sacking of Scalitz. Watertown, baby. Little is known about the war in 1402 to 1403, when Sigismund invaded Bohemia and tried to seize power, and the records that do exist are fairly vague. However, we do know the fate of Skalitz, Silver Skalitz, Silver Skalitz, which was burned to the ground on twenty third on the twenty third of March, uh, in 1403. We know the exact date because a document was preserved that Sigismund signed that day in the siege camp. Sigismund undoubtedly chose Scalitz because silver was mined here, and the town was administered by the royal hetman, Rashek Kobla, a supporter of the king. Sigismund apparently wanted to disrupt the flow of money going to Wenceslas. According to legend, Kobla and his people, who were hiding from the attackers in the castle, were able to escape because of a great storm that blew up and forced the besieging army to wait until morning to take the castle. The castle defenders took advantage of the opportunity and, under the cover of darkness, fled to nearby Ratay. In the morning, the only thing Sigismund's men found in the empty castle was a goat. This is also in the game. <laughs> really? <laughs> Sigismund then raised the town and the castle to the ground, and the castle was never rebuilt. Today, only the foundations remain. The Western Schism The Papal Schism, or Western Schism, was a rift in the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages, during which there were two papacies existing simultaneously, one in Rome and the other in Avignon, France. It began in 1378, the year after Pope Gregory XI brought the Papal Court back to Rome from Avignon where it had resided for almost 70 years due to hostilities between the Roman papacy and the Kingdom of France. When Gregory died, the Neapolitan Bartolomeo, Bartolomeo Prigignano was elected pope with the name Urban VI uh, from 1378 to 1389. He, however, quarreled with the very college of cardinals that had elected him, they therefore declared his election void and elected a new second pontiff, Pope Clement of the Seventh, from 1378 to 1404, who re-established the papal court in Avignon and was recognized by Scotland, Castile, Aragon, Navarre, and Portugal. Siding with Pope Urban the Sixth in Rome were Italy, Germany, Bohemia, England, and Ireland. Flanders, Poland, and Hungary. The schism continued even after the death of the original rival popes with the election of Boniface IX in Rome from 1389 to 1404 and Benedict XIII in Avignon from 1394 to 1423. The popes in Avignon were called antipopes, at this time, European efforts to restore the unity of the Roman Catholic Church were growing. Unfortunately, neither the council nor the popes themselves were able to reconcile, as neither side was willing to budge from their demands. In 1409, the dispute escalated to the point that the cardinals declared both popes invalid and elected a third, the antipope John the 
23rd. I think. Four to, from 1410 through 1415. None of the popes submitted to being dethroned, however. The conflicts embroiled the rulers of the various countries involved. Amongst, among others, Sigismund of Luxembourg, who took the side of John the 23rd. I think it's 23. I don't know. The Council of Constance was convened on November the 5th, 1414, to resolve the issue. The council secured the resignations of anti-pope John the 23rd and the Roman Pope Gregory the 12th. And in 1417 elected a new pope, Martin V, from 1417 through 1431, based in Rome. This essentially brought an end to the schism. Although there were subsequently two more anti-popes who continued to be supported by a minority, Benedict the 4th and Clement the 8th, who resigned in 1429, leaving Martin V once again the sole pontiff. And with that being said, everyone, that is the complete end of all the streams for Kingdom Come Deliverance. Thank you all so much for watching and sticking by, and even watching the VODs for these. Seriously, I really appreciate it. It requires a lot of patience, especially because the only action there is me reading. And I fuck up a lot. But, that is it for now. I didn't get every single lore book or codex that there is to get. So, if you want to play this game, it is still 75% off on Steam, I do believe, which is $10 at the moment. And you can find all these little bitties yourself. But for me, that's going to have to be the end of Kingdom Come Deliverance. No more streams will be showing up for this game, and unless it's the, the newer ones. So, with that being said, thank you all so much for watching it again, and... I hope you all enjoyed if you did. And that is the end of the stream. Bye, everybody. Bye.